This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Before we begin the festivities this week, we here at Friends Talking Nerdy would like to make the announcement that we, along with the other podcast, Film, Films and Fer- Fermentations, a part of the Deluxe Edition Network, are the February podcast of the month. Hey! Good you, job. Good job, both of us. And I don't think we've had a chance to mention it in uh, the show as of yet. But uh, in January, I forgot the specific week, but it was a couple of weeks ago as we record this, Professor Aubrey was the podcaster of the week. That's right. You got to strut around and all that stuff. Like, podcaster, yeah. <laughs> You went to a bar, you were like, I was the podcaster of the week, buy me drinks, and everybody did. Yep. Super awesome. Portland is such a giving town, right? It is, really. There you go. I mean, any reason to go to a bar and talk to strangers, really. Yeah. You know how I love to do that. Me too. That's why we're here, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's why we're here, hanging out with our friend, the microphone. That's right. Well... Anyway, we would love love to uh, thank everybody at the Deluxe, the, <laughs> yeah, I can talk, the Deluxe Edition Network for this particular honor. Uh, since joining the network, I've definitely seen a lot more activity in terms of uh, social media, um, people bouncing back and forth, um, you know, signal boosting and, and, and whatnot. And most importantly, we have uh, seen a uh, a decent bump in numbers too uh, for downloads as well. So everything so far I've I've thought has been amazing. We've been received well, and um, our show has been celebrated as such. Yeah, it's really great because we just joined the Deluxe Edition Network not that long ago, and so it's wonderful. Indeed. So once again, thank you all, and enjoy the show. Your friends are nerdy and you are nerdy too. I want to talk to you, friends talking nerdy. This is the podcast making, public transit taking, kiss stealing, wheeling dealing, son of a gun, Tim the Nerd, welcoming you to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy, part of the Deluxe Edition Network. Head to deluxeeditionnetwork.com to find out about all of the lovely shows on the den. Seated next to me, as warm as she can be on such a chilly day as this, we have the greatest legal mind of the Pacific Northwest, Professor Aubrey. How are you doing? Hello, hello. How I am doing really well, Tim. As you know, we're surviving the Arctic ice storm. Here in Portland, it's been about a week, it feels like, since the whole thing started. And I've been snowed in somewhere for a week, for sure. And it's been really cold. And I've been afraid my power's going to go off. So it, it was an ice storm, meaning everything got covered with ice, like an inch or more of ice on like every surface the twigs and the trees. And so then of course branches fall or whole trees have been peeling over all over around here and falling on people's houses and falling on power lines and people are getting killed by down power lines and dying of hypothermia. Like it's, it's been a real disaster. Yeah, and and for folks that are listening to this, this is going to be released a couple of weeks out um, from the moment that we're recording this, and we're recording this on January eighteenth. And yeah, it Portland has always been weird when it comes to winter during my time here, and you know I know you've lived in uh, other snowy places around the country as well, so you've experienced maybe not. No, not really. I mean, I grew up in the south where. This is what would have happened in the South had this same storm happened. 
And Democrats would have been blamed. <laughs> and the Democrats would have been blamed, yes. Yeah, um, but I come from... Here we blame Trump. Yeah, I come from Michigan myself, um, and as we know, I, I lived uh, in Maine for a few months, and, you know, I've the difference between those places and Portland, and we've talked about this before, is the fact that this type of weather usually will last maybe about a week, maybe a little bit more, maybe 10 days, maybe 14 days at the most, but it usually warms back up enough in a reasonable amount of time that for a city as big as Portland, it does not make financial sense for them to have an entire fleet of snow plows and salt trucks. I get that. It's a pain in the ass, though, because walking downstairs, not fun. I mean, we almost fell. And when we when you were taking me to work today, there was a woman that was like lying on the ground crying. <laughs> and I'm not laughing at her predicament, but uh, but it was just like she, you know, she hurt her head bad. And thankfully, someone else was able to uh, they were closer to her. So they were able to, you know, like call the paramedics and stuff like that to help her out but like it is no joke the people here are not prepared for winter no way no way no how and you're supposed to shovel your sidewalk right of course nobody does and even where they had shoveled the snow that came last weekend the ice just covered the bare spots in the pavement yeah and also, too, like I, I know in Maine, uh, the Reverend and her husband, you know, get, got me a gift of, and I don't know their specific name, but they're things you can slip on your shoes that have like little metal. Um, in this case, it was like coiled metal around rubber that you that will make it to where you can walk on ice and not worry about uh, slipping and stuff like that. And yeah, people can get that, and there are enough like REI, even though that's closing, and you know, within the next month or so. I mean, there are plenty of hiking places in town to where, you know, you can get stuff like that. But generally, too, in places where it's not as cold, the cold stuff is going to be a little bit more pricey than it would be in, like, Alaska if you bought it. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, probably in Alaska you can buy them at the gas station. And a lot of people here needed it because... Yeah, and I remember the last time there was an ice storm, I actually ordered a pair of those things, and then I held on to them for like 12 years. There was never another ice storm. <laughs> so I got rid of them when I downsized, and then, of course, I wish that I had them. Yeah, I mean, because the previous winter stuff, like, there was some ice involved, but uh, mostly it was just the snow, uh, you know, making it to where the roads were not traversable. Um, but it is weird. This time, they, it, I, I guess Portland does have some um, snow plow, you know, preparations in place in terms of some vehicles, but it is not enough to you know take care of the entire city i mean essentially from what i'm seeing um even though the buses here have chains and everything um mainly it's the roads that are traversed by by your bus or you know roads that are going to be traversed by uh semi trucks because money needs to be protected right yeah people got to get to work yeah and um goods got to move yeah i mean it it was just stu stupid though because like getting off the bus on, on the way home from work today the bus stop area wasn't shoveled wasn't salted and stuff like that and you would think that would be something that you know maybe they would have emergency crews do that or make it to where maybe the buses are delayed a little bit but the driver at the start of the shift not necessarily shovels but you know has a bag of like salt that he can toss you know liberally in front of a bus stop or something like that through the first part of his run you know his or her well you know that is i'm sure something that they don't want to do i wouldn't want to have that extra duty of putting salt down on things when my job is to be a driver. You know, sometimes though, you got to do what you got to do because you are helping your customers out. I disagree entirely. I think if a worker has a job and a job description, that worker should be able to work to that job description. And if it doesn't include picking up heavy bags of salt and throwing salt around on in icy conditions, then I don't think that the you know, I wouldn't judge my health and safety by that as that worker. If I, that's what I was going to do, if that's what I signed up for, fine. The way I see it is this. There are 
it, it, there is not a reality to where every single job is going to have the luxury of having one job description that a person has to do and that's all they have to do. I think every job that you have will have additional things that come on the radar that you just take care of. Having said that, I think the big thing to look out for are companies that take advantage of that. And usually the bigger the company, the more likely they're going to do that. Because um, especially with the types of employment that I've had uh, in my past via retail, th they count on the employees not getting the courage to get the strength to consolidate together to defend their rights as employees to, to the company. You know, um, having said that, though, to, to me, though, like we're talking one additional thing. And that one additional thing will allow the passengers in question to hopefully cross fingers, be a little more safe while waiting at the bus stop. And I'm You're not saying not addressing my concerns at all. You haven't said anything about what I said, which is a health and safety concern. How you're deciding that all the bus drivers can do this, can pick up these bags of salt, put them on their bus, get the salt off at every stop, themselves get off their seats and get out of the bus and do that. You're assuming a lot about the people who are bus drivers. No, because people that do have pre-existing pre medical conditions are able to already go to their bosses and say, I physically can't do X, Y, or Z, but I can do A, B, and C. It, if the bus driver in question physically can't do it, then by all means, let that bus driver take advantage of, you know, to, of, of that particular thing right there, of telling their boss in question that, you know, physically I can't do it. I, like as someone with a lower lumbar sprain, I get it. At times when my back is particularly... I don't feel like I should have to yard sale all of my medical problems in front of my employer just to be able to do the job I was hired to do. But people that don't have degrees that high school diplomas are that are lucky to get work like that, sometimes that's just reality. It's not right. I'm not. The, and I I wish it were better. I get I get you. I get you. But here's why they don't do it at TriMet. They have a union. They have a union that says you don't get to work out of your job description. It's not written on your job description. You do not do it. Not only are you not supposed to do it, you will be in trouble if you do it. And that is how they keep the workload creep and the the job changing over time. Um, that's how you keep that from happening. The only way you can keep that from happening is to have a union. And that I agree. I mean, I think a lot of retail would run a lot better if the employees were able to defend, uh, you know, their rights as employees for a particular company. Because believe it or not, there are people that have worked at Best Buy for 10, 20, 30 years and are proud to work there. It is not this myth that employees start unions because they hate the job that they have they hate their employer but when you have big corporations that you know do routinely step on the neck of their employees just to help out their shareholders you know more and more places should take advantage of that all i'm saying at the end of the day is i you know maybe a couple of additional steps who knows maybe i my idea doesn't work out but maybe there's something else that could be done because they do have like you know like traveling mechanics that have trucks that you know that do go for, because if a bus breaks down they you know they you know it's best to have a mechanic go there first to see if they can get it back up and running again instead of just having to do the tow situation or whatever so maybe they're the ones that you know just do again a one time sweep in the morning with salt and they get something extra to do and guess what maybe Maybe throw them a little extra cheddar cheese if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm just like I always do, just playing devil's advocate. But I mean, I, I see how that would be a low priority given keeping the buses running. If you don't have the buses running, there's no point in having bus stops. So like if they have to prioritize what they spend time on, I would rather them spend time chaining up the buses so the buses can get places. 
Yeah, and they are definitely getting places. Sometimes late, sometimes really, really late, but at least they're getting places. Yeah, that happened this morning, didn't it? Yeah, the bus that I was supposed to be on, according to the app I use to track when uh, they arrive, uh, said that for whatever reason, the bus was not going to show up. So, yay! (laughs) Just not coming. Yeah, yeah. Ghost bus. Something like that. You got ghosted by TriMet. At least I didn't get a disease. Anyway. (laughs) All right. Well, um, first of all, last week's episode was an amazing interview. Uh, I think we'd like to thank Dr. Karen Stahls now uh, uh, once again for uh, taking time out of her day because it was snowy and icy uh, in her hometown of Denver, Colorado, too. But we had a great conversation with her. We really did. I had a lot of fun talking to her. Indeed. And uh, we definitely recommend you check out that episode. Check out her podcast, Monster Talk. I, What I like about it is that it takes the skeptic's approach to talking about phenomena that, you know, people do experience in some way, shape, or form, you know, but they talk about it, you know, again, through a skeptic size. Uh, you know, she was part of the Australian Ske- uh, Skeptics magazine for a while, as we mentioned on the episode, knew the amazing Randy. Uh, so, you know, she, I trust that, you know, she took the right steps. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. Um, and, you know, I think it's really interesting to find out or to 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 conjecture, to, to suppose what might be, you know, the real um, thing behind the monster. And, you know, there are stories like that, movies like that, where you find, you know, a, a monster is revealed to be, you know, a little guy or, you know, somebody with an ego problem or, you know, a very vulnerable character. Just like in Scooby-Doo. Just like on Scooby-Doo. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so it's sort of like that. Yeah, uh, one of her recent one of the recent episodes on Monster Talk was about AI, and there are a number of movies and TV shows, sci-fi wise, that have talked about AI. I mean, the most famous uh, that I can think of at the moment is the Terminator franchise. Mm. Automatic the intelligence, uh, you know, ended up taking over the world, and humankind had to fight back. But the episode in question was about what really happens with artificial intelligence, where we are today, and talks about the possibilities based on actual science on if something like a Terminator could potentially happen, you know? Yeah. So, interesting stuff. Like I mentioned, uh, check out that show, Monster Talk. Did want to talk about WWE briefly here. Um, it's news that uh, was released a while ago, but I have I haven't had a chance to bring it up yet. Bray Wyatt. Uh, his real name was Wyndham Rotunda, passed away a few months back. Mm. Um, his character was kind of like a 21st century Undertaker type of character, if that makes sense, because they presented his character as like supernatural at times and, you know, weird stuff happened. But like I mentioned, he recently passed away and the WWE, what they've done is, you know, with his estate, signed him what is to what is called a Legends contract that is essentially going to allow them to put the Bray Wyatt character in video games. They'll make documentaries on, you know, for Peacock, uh, for the WWE portion of that or wherever they go in the future. And, you know, maybe because like Bray Wyatt's brother is still alive, for instance, and was supposed to be a part of a storyline that would have still been happening if Bray had not passed. So that stuff's going to happen. But the benefit of this Legends contract is that all the money is going to go to Bray Wyatt's four kids. So they're going to be comfortable for the rest of their lives. They're going to be able to go to college. And while there are some, maybe some cynics that will be out there that will say that's the least they can do, there aren't many organizations, big companies like that, that will do that, especially on the creative end. Look at comic books. Like the guy who created Rocket Raccoon from the Guardians of the Galaxy movie had to do a GoFundMe. I don't think... Disney sh- should have necessarily made him a billionaire or something like that. But how does it make a co- big corporation look when they're making billions of dollars off of something that one person created and that person has to do a GoFundMe? I mean, that's like pocket change for the Disney corporation. And they could make sure he, you know, that person had, you know, as well of a time in a hospital as he could without having to worry about paying one damn dime. But 
WWE in this particular case, even though I've been very critical of them and go back in our archives and you can see, you know, all the times that I've done that when they do something right, it needs to be called out. And in this particular case, they did right. Sounds like it. Yes. <laughs> Most importantly, though, what do you think their other option would have been? Like if they wanted to like put the screws to them or just say like, we don't care about you. What, what is, what was their other option? I mean, like, it, didn't he own the guy who died? Didn't he own his own likeness? The WWE owned the name Bray Wyatt, and they uh, owned the likeness of Bray Wyatt when he's presented on their TV shows or video games. He, if it's like this, there are wrestlers that have, uh, you know, their names changed in WWE. And when they are let go by that company, they can no longer go by those names. WWE, in theory, would still be able, I mean, and still does releases like videotape, not videotapes anymore, but, you know, videos um, on, on Peacock of, you know, old matches where people are still there. So they have the ability to play the old stuff, essentially, but, you know, not new but if you don't own that name you can't you have to start from scratch you know so the, the, i mean that is that is how it goes in a wrestling business you know i mean it's it's not something to where the average professional wrestler should assume it's there for a career because it, it because of the physical aspect of that um of that job you, you're going to be lucky at minimum to get five years if you can get more great that is great but you know bodies don't hold up and also not everybody is a john cena <laughs> not everybody's a cm punk mm -hmm. you may be physically great in the ring but if you have no charisma or personality you're not going to go far and you're not going to have much of a career that's right because it's entertainment it is entertainment. Now, I mean, there are different ways to tell wrestling type of stories. WWE is more about the soap opera aspect. There are other companies that are more about the in-ring product. So there are places to go. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, someone, you know, let go by the WWE should never uh, wrestle again or something like that. But, you know, uh, they are the big dog. They're the big dog. They are the industry standard. They are the standard that the casual person off the street that may not be a wrestling fan accepts in America. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like I said, good on them for doing the right thing in this particular case for Bray Wyatt's kids. Yeah, good on them. Yep. All right. And as we record this, we are a couple uh, days past from the Iowa Republican caucuses. And boy, was the media garbage throughout that it was such a garbage situation yeah i mean no surprise trump ended up winning 98 out of the 99 uh areas of iowa uh that they um you know all voted in and you know i i guess the i mean the news was presenting this as if it was like the worst possible th like this is worse than hiroshima or something like that this is the absolute worst news without really presenting the actual facts here like this is a primary this was a closed primary only republicans were going to be voting here two trump only got of the people that did take advantage take part in this caucus trump only got 51 percent of the vote now the others you know went you know some went to nikki haley some went to ron DeSantis, others went elsewhere but it doesn't show a united Republican Party around Trump. Trump's numbers that, that he won by the total amount was less than Ted Cruz in 2016. Mm -hmm. And historically, um, I guess for both Republicans and Democrats, Iowa doesn't predict the, you know, it doesn't predict who ultimately wins. Nine times out of 10, the person who wins Iowa doesn't go far. Pat Robertson in 88, I believe, won in Iowa. So, yeah. I, Why don't people purposefully lose? Well, some do. Some understand that, you know, they, you know, the brand that they're selling as politicians may not work in one particular area if you're talking a nationwide election. So they put all their eggs in another basket. I mean, like um, Ron DeSantis went, spent over $100 million in Iowa, got 20% of the vote in second place. 
So, you know, you might as well just set that on fire. It would have been better use. But Nikki Haley, on the other hand, you know, spent a fair amount, a fair amount to be fair. But, you know, she also put a fair amount in New Hampshire. And um, being that she is a former governor of South Carolina, she's hoping South Carolina will help, you know, do what it did for Biden uh, back in 2020 be the thing that kind of, uh, you know, puts her in, in form of the horse race, because, you know, the same thing happened with Biden. Biden didn't win the, fir the first couple primaries in 2020, but once South Carolina came along, boom, everything just coalesced real fast in, in terms of support for him. But the numbers are showing that Republicans aren't as united around Trump as we're made to believe on the news and two, what was really heartening even on Fox news. And it was primarily with Nikki Haley voters, but you did have a number of voters that were on the record on the news stating that if Trump is the nominee for the Republican party, they're voting for Biden. This does not mean Democrats should rest on their laurels. By no means should we do that because we don't know what's going to happen between now and election day. But I do think that this is something to take note of and, and kind of, in a way, breathe a sigh of relief. Like, uh, you know, some may argue that because of the weather conditions in Iowa, maybe the turnout was a little lower than it would have been. And I'll grant you that. But if you have over a million registered Republicans in a state and only about 100,000 or so are, are, are voting overall... That's not support. People people stayed home. Yeah. Some they thought if if they weren't going to vote for Trump, they weren't going to vote for anybody. So they stayed home. If they were really passionate, they would have been there. Look what happened during the pandemic. I mean, d d during the election and the pandemic, people, it, it, depending on where you were in the country, braved long lines with people that didn't necessarily care about mass and stuff like that to vote. They were passionate. It didn't happen in Iowa, and I think people should see that as a very, very good sign about the future. Don't stop fighting by any means, but recognize what actually happened in Iowa, and it's not what the news tried to proclaim. Again, the news tried to proclaim this as, oh my God, he's storming his way through, but if you look at the numbers, too, from like the nine, uh, of the 98 places that he won in Iowa, he, like the margin of victory in each of those individual places wasn't by much. You know, and also if you add up the votes of everybody else, like your Haley DeSantis and whatnot, and compared it to Trump and just had, you know, and just pretended it, you know, it was all one big mass vote and a popular type of thing, he only won by a little over 2,000 votes. He's not the figurehead necessarily that people think he is. He's more than likely at this point, yeah going to get that nomination, but he, we know he's not going to pick someone smarter than him as vice president. I mean, rumor has it that Marjorie Taylor Greene is on the short list. And do you think the, aver the average independent-minded person is, is really going to want to get behind that because, like, even even if you go to 2016, like, for as loathsome as Mike Pence is as a human being, you could kind of get it. You could see where people thought, maybe for what Trump doesn't know as a politician, Mike Pence could help him out. You could see people making that logic. But if someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene or some other goof is his vice president, come on. I mean, having said that, again... Democrats have a long history of losing races they should have won. So this isn't over by a long shot, but this is good news in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. This is Democrats to lose, really, um, sort of like it was the first time you ran. And everybody was like, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. And it wasn't a joke, and it's not a joke this time. So I hear what you're saying. But I also think we should be terrified that Trump was able to get 51% of the vote. I 100% agree. Don't take what I said as we can breathe a sigh of relief because until November 2024 happens and election day occurs, I, come on, we, we've seen what he's done already. We've seen what he's talking about now. Like he is openly 
calling for violence against the Supreme Court for for them potentially, you know, ruling against him in in the the 14th Amendment case from Colorado. He's saying that there would be un you know unleashed chaos, and, and Keith Olbermann calls it stochastic terrorism. And he's stoking that fire. He's wording it in just a way to where a, a Weasley scumbag would, would be able to say, oh, I didn't mean it that way. Mm-hmm. But we know he means it that way. We've seen him f- since 2015, once he announced, and before, before when he wasn't a politician, he did stupid evil things, but we just laughed it off because he's a rich celebrity. Ha ha ha. Mm-hmm. Now that he's got power and we've seen what he's done, are we really going to th- make that mistake again of stating, oh, well, he's probably joking. He really doesn't mean it. And, and look at the Republican Project 2025 plan that they want to put in place if they get the White House again. They want to literally have a loyalty t- a loyalty test to whoever is in charge at that particular time. They want to fire tons and tons of quote unquote bureaucrats mm. and hire and put into political, place. political appointees. Exactly. You know who did that? Hmm. Andrew Jackson. He cleaned house. He fired basically everybody who worked in Washington, DC and appointed. I mean, it was just nepotism and there was no law against it. I, so. I'm sure they've ended up making a law because of that. <laughs> I don't know if they did or not. I, 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 because the problem is the people in control don't want to give up the control. And so when they get into control, they don't change the law that they thought was stupid before they had that power. And a lot of times, too, uh, it's like there are a number of times where you will have political parties, even if they have the power, not necessarily change something. Like when the Democrats had both the Senate and the House and they didn't you know, codify Roe v. Way uh, into law, even though they could have, because if you think about it cynically, it's, it helps them out still having that boogeyman of, you know, it, it it being, I mean, politicians, they suck. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But uh, this is, an important election if there ever was one you know like i said we'll we'll keep these types of types of things short and sweet uh throughout the year but um this is one you cannot ignore folks and i think it is a good thing to acknowledge when good things happen and it is also important to call out the media on their bullshit when they're uh, essentially stoking fires just to keep viewers watching yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So how about we take a break from all of this and send it, to, unless you had something to say. No, I was just going to say that too. Like, why don't we, why don't we move away from politics and maybe we can hear from one of our fellow podcasts in the um, Deluxe Edition Podcast Network. I say that's a good idea. So take it away. <laughs> Do you enjoy movies? Do you enjoy adult beverages? Do you enjoy conversations that could go off the rails at any second? If you said yes to any of these questions, then you should check out the Films and Fermentation podcast. I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. We're just three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting shit-faced. So join us every week as we discuss interesting movie topics like best ensemble films, most paused moments in cinema, and the occasional movie review, plus so much more. When you add drinking, you have no idea where this conversation could go. So find us on Spotify, Apple Pods, Good Pods, YouTube, or wherever you go to listen to your favorite shows. You can also visit linktree.com slash films and fermentation to find all of our social media and podcast links. We'll be waiting for you to join us weekly at the crossroads between pickled and fermented. Cheers. Cheers. Relationships falling apart really suck. What a great introduction, folks. But this week, 
The professor found a great article on psychology today, and the title of it is The Number One Reason Why Relationships Fall Apart, and that is going to be our main event this week. But what intrigued you about this particular article? What, what, yeah. Well, I really agree with the article. You know, then I'll tell you the number one reason is people grow apart, and I think that is why relationships change is that people grow and change themselves and sometimes that means we're no longer compatible with the people that we once were really compatible with and i don't think and so i think the premise here is there are things that you can do to remain connected to each other even as you are growing and changing as an individual and that your relationship can grow and change with you, or at least there's that option. And it's not really talked about much if you think about it. Like when, you know, when you're in your 20s and having that first big love of your life, you know, if anybody mentioned it to me, I don't remember it. And it is important to think of because, yeah, you can't control time. People that have, even if you live together, you can still have past diverge, different interests uh, occur and whatnot. I mean, the beauty of polyamory, of course, is that that doesn't necessarily mean a relationship necessarily has to change, but, you, you know. Or that it changes rather than ends. Yeah, or end, yeah. Yeah, because it is not a bad thing to acknowledge that people just grow apart and grow different. I think the important thing is to not have that fear like I, you know the reason i stayed stayed married for as long as i did was i had fear that i wouldn't be able to survive outside of marriage that i wouldn't be able to find love outside of marriage you know why would anybody want me and none of that was true you know like you have to under you have to accept that the person that you love, that you are in the first years of a hopefully, you know, cross fingers, long-term relationship with, you do have to accept the fact that, you know, similar to accepting the fact in marriage that it's a good idea to have a prenuptial agreement, no matter how poor or rich you are, you have to accept the fact that there is a possibility and a very good possibility that this person you're with your paths could diverge at some point. And the best thing you can do is make changes now and maybe changes is not necessarily the best word to put there but make something now to to put it in place now so that in the future if that does happen if the paths do diverge in some way it's not going to hurt as much it will hurt it will still hurt but if you acknowledge that it could potentially happen and responsibly you know go ahead and you know deal with that then you know do you know what i mean i know what you mean and i think we you know what we want to do is get away from all of these thoughts of like being so enmeshed with some or in, entangled having your life so entangled with another person i think interferes with individual ability to to explore and grow and challenge themselves um individually and then i, I also think it stymies the the couple as well so one thing is not allowing society to define for you what a relationship should look like um, and then you not buying into that idea that society tries to tell you that all you need is this other person, this one other person, and your life will be complete. Exactly. I mean, think about the times to where you hear, in, in this case, you know, public figures, for instance, going back to wrestling, Vince and Linda McMahon. You found out during the whole, you know, Wall Street Journal articles about Vince McMahon that they had been living apart, that they had essentially both went on with their lives, but they were both still legally married. And you know, I'm sure that, you know, they, you know, met up at times for like family gatherings and did stuff that way. I mean, I don't know them personally, so I don't know the ins and outs of that particular relationship. But if this is something that they both agreed upon and were okay with and understood that they were both in different places, because Linda, for instance, was, you know, working in Washington. She was part of Trump's cabinet, you know, and she was the head of the small business administration. 
you know, yeah, WWE and small business. There you go. But uh, there, there, if they both came to that conclusion that you know, hey, like us as a romantic couple is over, but we're cool with still being married and you know sharing some things. But I'll live here, you live there, do your own thing. I, that's, in my opinion. That is beautiful. Now, what Vince did, he's a scumbag, you know, um, with the whole uh, NDAs and hush, pay, hush money payment and all that stuff. But, you know, if if that was taken off the table and he just had a girlfriend or two or five, that's that's how it should be. That's how it should be. In terms of two people in a relationship, uh, you know, being able to, not how it should be, too harsh, too too definite of, of a term but two you know two people in a in a marriage that decide hey we want to live in separate homes but we still want to be legally married and blah 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 you know yeah okay. anyhow uh, yeah. now that we've talked about the nature of relationships um what we wanted to do was just give some tips all right some tips about how to avoid outgrowing your partner and help you navigate the journey of changing and growing and evolution for both yourself and your couple so what's the first one there all right and the article in question the number one reason why relationships fall apart uh written by john kim lmft and he has the heading here of the angry therapist so i assume he's a podcaster of some sort but I will dive into number one, open and honest communication. Regularly communicate with your partner about your desires, goals, and aspirations. Share your personal growth experiences and encourage them to do the same. This creates an environment of trust and understanding, allowing both of you to support each other's growth. Well said. I mean, I don't know how much more you can uh, add on to that because it is true. It is hard, and you do have to fight the urge of smiling and saying, everything's okay, <laughs> you know, um, if something is not okay. But having that open, regular talk and honest talk as well is, is vital because it allows you, if you are coming at it in an honest way, it allows you to be able to deal with what happens afterward in an honest way and in a healthy way. Sure. I mean, I think it is what allows you to avoid having negative, like things happening in your relationship you don't want to have happening, um, is to be able to know what your desires, goals, and values, and all of those things are, and then understand how your relationship is either contributing to those or not contributing to those, and like what you can share with your partner. Like... It's helpful for us to process our experiences. It's not enough just to have an experience. And so is our partner someone who can can process those things with us to help us in our personal growth? Or do we just sit around on the couch and not even really talk to each other? I agree. Well said there. How about you dive into number two? Okay, number two, shared interests and experiences. Find common interests and activities you can enjoy together. Engaging in new experiences as a couple can help you grow and evolve together. It could be trying out new hobbies, exploring new places, or learning something new as a team. I really love this. I think this is really important. And it doesn't have to be like some fancy thing that you like go and take a jewelry making class together or um, dance salsa or like something that's pretty elaborate. It could be doing a podcast. Could be doing podcasts. Could be cooking meals together. Could be watching a show that you like and talking about the show afterwards. You know, it doesn't have to be some big romantic thing. But going on to number one as well. I mean, it's if you if you are at a point where you do want a big romantic gesture, it is important to be able to say to the other person in an open and honest way, "Hey, how about we potentially think about a big romantic gesture at some point." Not like that, but you, you get my point, you know, being able to express that, hey, making dinner and watching a movie at home is great and all, but 
maybe I would like to go out to a movie theater and actually eat at a restaurant instead sometime, or maybe we can go to a pottery class sometime, you know, or because like in Portland, for instance, you do have bars that have, you know, ceramics that you can make. So it can be just a one-time deal at that particular thing, but you're able to do that. Yeah, totally. The DIY bar. I've gone there before with a friend and you just go in, you pick out your project, your project, you can have a beer and make your project and the project is done within like an hour. They have all the materials, they give you the patterns. It's really fun. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, it is important to have... The, uh, to have the shared interest and experience. I mean, it is vital. If you don't have that, um, I mean, that's kind of fuel for a relationship in a lot of ways. But to your point, it can be both small and 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 big. It as long as it's happening, that's the important thing. Yeah. All right. Shall I go on with yes, number please. three? Embrace individual growth. Encourage and support each other's growth journeys. Understand that personal growth is not a threat to the relationship, but rather an opportunity for both of you be to become better versions of yourselves. Celebrate each other's achievements and provide a safe space for personal exploration. Very important. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people do get lost in the idea of being scared of losing a person you know if they have a partner that wants to go take a class somewhere or or you know somehow gets another you know and because of their own personal growth ended up getting a better job or something like that to where they ended up making more money maybe person number one is you know at that could be scared of losing that person and then ends up making bad choices that eventually that essentially push that person away but embracing the growth of the other person celebrating the growth of the other person yeah if you do have a partner that was able to get a well-paying job and they started making a lot more money than you why not celebrate that that is a beautiful thing and you know as we talked about relationships aren't necessarily forever anyway hopefully they can be um you know but but it just if you can't worry about something that hasn't happened yet you know you can't have that fear of a person leaving you because they're in a better spot quote unquote you should celebrate that because that is makes them uh, you should make uh, tell them how proud you are for the growth that they have and you know and let them enjoy their happiness more because you are acknowledging that well and i, I like the last thing which is provide a space a safe space for personal exploration so, like, how can I cultivate an environment where you could come to me and say, you know, I've just discovered that I really like this thing that might be threatening to me. And a lot of times changes are threatening. And so that ability to not be threatened and instead embrace changes in your partner as growth and celebrate with them that growth because you know that it's good for them and you know that it makes them happy. That's the kind of attitude I think that is necessary to to foster individual growth in each other. Indeed, and I think that ties into our next point. So why don't you dive into that? Certainly. Continual learning. Commit to lifelong learning as a couple. Read books, attend workshops, or take courses together that align with your interests and goals. This shared pursuit of knowledge and personal development can deepen your connection and keep you engaged in each other's growth. Okay, I have never been in a relationship in which this has occurred, where I read books with people or attended the same workshops. Like, that kind of thing I feel is like self-development for me and not something that I do as part of a joint thing. Like, most of the things I do as joint things, I consider like fun or recreational things. I would counter though that it's not necessarily stating what you are learning from from the books in question, what workshops you're taking, what courses you're taking. It could be tied in to point number two of shared interests and experiences because you know there are workshops at a comic con, for instance. And if you're, you know, both interested in comic books and that's your shared interest, 
then, you know, yeah, taking that time to read a comic, uh, read a book about, uh, you know, how comics are made or attending a workshop about illustrations or something like that. Because let's say one person's a writer and then one partner's a writer and another partner's an illustrator or something like that. That type of workshop would be good too. Now, uh, again, I'm, that's, I, I'm reading into this more than anything um, because it didn't specifically say, but I think if you look at it in that way, then it's a lot you know, you could see it happening more organically instead of let us take a workshop about our relationship. <laughs> you know, no, or even like let's take a home building workshop, or let's, you know, I just, I've always wanted to have a relationship in in which that was happening, but I also, I'm very protective of my individual relationships and my individual experiences. Like, I definitely like having things that nobody else is involved in. And, and you know, that... And I don't think this is saying you can't have that. Yeah, well, true. Number three, embrace an individual growth. That is something that should be embraced. You know, people learning stuff on their own for, you know, whatever, uh, whatever that is. And uh, both are right. Let's put it that way. Both are and can be right. To your point, yeah, not every relationship is <laughs> is going to be, you know, the type where you have your whole day marked out, your whole week marked out, your whole year marked out on the calendar of all the joint events you're going to do with your partner. You're not going to go to the same college classes if you decide to, you know, take college classes in your spare time or something like that. I mean, there are people out there that do that. It's not for everybody, but it's all also about what works for you because relationships do take work and you know even even if you two people in one particular relationship agree that you don't necessarily have to do extra steps or something like that there are still steps involved we know this yeah absolutely all right shall i go on to the next one absolutely go ahead all right number five Regular check-ins. Set aside time for regular check-ins to assess the state of your relationship and individual growth. Discuss any concerns or challenges you may face and work together to find solutions. This proactive approach helps address issues before they become major obstacles. And regular doesn't, doesn't have to be every three months on the dot, anything like that. Just regular just means, you know, taking that time whenever it feels right to do that check-in. Hopefully it is consistent. I think that is going to be key. Hopefully it's consistent, but it doesn't have to be every third Thursday of the month. You know? No, or if that fits into your life, then it can be. Like, well, if you need to schedule that time, then you should schedule it. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I'm like, get to the point where I need to schedule those kinds of things, because if I don't, they won't ever get done because I don't want like, they're not my favorite conversations to have. They're challenging conversations. Growth is challenging. All of this stuff is challenging. Sometimes you just want to sit on the couch and watch a TV show. But I like the idea that we've agreed we're going to have regular check-ins. And that either of us can say, hey, let's check in anytime. And see how that goes. And if it if neither of us were ever saying let's check in, I would sort of artificially impose something so that we were at least checking in, even if we didn't think we needed to. Just to talk about, you know, the good things that are going on. Yeah. Because it's e it can be easy to overlook good things. I mean, we've talked about this one in terms in terms of like self thought, for instance, how people on their own tend to always think about the negatives of themselves more often than the good things, but focusing on the good things at times even if it's a small victory it's still a victory pat yourself on the back and you know when it comes to a relationship if a relationship has a victory even if it's small pat yourself on the back that's a good thing you need to be happy about those victories absolutely all right how about you dive into the last bullet point all here? right the last bullet point flexibility and adaptability Understand that growth and change are not linear processes. Be open to adapting and adjusting your expectations as you and your partner evolve. Embrace the idea that your relationship will go through different phases and be willing to navigate them together. Adapting and adjusting your expectations. I think adaptation is like one of the 
one of the most important things you can do in order to be a good partner is to be able to adapt to various scenarios. And then the other thing, other than adaptation, is this idea of adjusting your expectations. And I, what I try to do in my relationships is to to put those expectations down on zero and not have expectations of other people because why why do I get to do that? Like, why do I get to be in charge of what somebody's prioritizing in their life? Or why do I get to be in charge of what they spend their time doing? I don't. So I my work is to accept those things that I can't necessarily adapt to. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, I, 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 the first sentence, understand that growth and change are not linear processes. They're not. Life is not a straight line. Life, you know, what you think your relationship will be at age 20 is going to be a lot different than what it's going to be at age 40. Trust me. And it's important to either roll with those changes or if you are being honest with yourself and your partner and you feel that those changes have come to an impasse to where maybe you do need to talk about splitting, do it honestly gonna hurt still gonna hurt but you have to be flexible you have to adapt and even if that adapting means that you understand that something like a romantic relationship can't necessarily go on anymore doesn't mean you have to stop talking to that person either you know it, it's just it's gonna be a fight though it is gonna be a fight because emotions come into play because fear comes into play. Um, you know, you, you don't know what the future is, people. And the person that you love today, you, the best thing you can do for them for the future is to create an atmosphere to where, yeah, flexibility and adaptability are there so that if it does come to the worst case scenario and paths diverge, they can diverge peacefully. And that there can be such an appreciation of the person that you want to stay connected to that person in whatever way, instead of blocking them out of your life, instead of turning away from the lessons you might've learned in that relationship. On the flip side too, though, with flexibility and adaptability, like maybe you do come to a point like 20 years in the marriage to where you do decide that, you know, we still want to be a couple, but maybe we will live apart or maybe we'll live in the same place, but become polyamorous and date other people as well. You know, it's be open to that. Don't be stuck in this mindset that you have to have a relationship play out like how society determines it's supposed to play out because you never, you don't know. You don't know what's going to work for you. You don't know what's going to work for your partner 20 years down the road. You could only focus on today, but without that flexibility and adaptability, that will make it harder in the future when changes occur because they will occur. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? No, it's been a lovely, it's been a lovely time with you, Tim. A very lovely time with you. Thank you once again for joining me on this lovely adventure on our wonderful show. Thank you for leading the show. In my own inimitable way. Yes. Each Monday, we'll have something in this podcast space to entertain your ear holes. Until we meet again, we bid you adieu. So long, folks. And thanks for all the fish. Subscribe to Friends Talking Dirty on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.